I am Oshin Fagan and I am with Nicole Flattery and this is In Jokes. We will be discussing comedy for the next hour or so, or maybe less. Uh, I'd like to thank the English Department of Maynooth and Kildare Library Services for this opportunity and Tracy for managing the recording. Nicole Flattery is the author of Show Them a Good Time, which was published in 2019 by Stinging Fly and Bloomsbury Press, I believe. She's won several awards, uh, the White Review, an Irish Times Book Award, many, many more, many more. <laughs> and, um, she's a regular contributor to the LRB. She's written for The Guardian and her debut novel, Nowhere Special, will be out next year with Bloomsbury. I'm, I, yeah. And I'm Oshin Fagan. Uh, I'm the writer in residence for Maynooth for this year. One of the writers in residence for Maynooth. So today we'll be discussing comedy, comedy writing, things like that. Um, but first I will say, and I agreed with Nicole, I'd say this, that we're not funny. <laughs> we're, this is we're artists intellectually discussing comedy okay yeah so don't this be is, expecting a good time <laughs> yeah <laughs> this will be arduous and slow like school okay <laughs> and thank you very much for being here nicole oh thank you for having me I'm yeah delighted. well it's nice we're back in our little 2d rectangles again i know yeah yeah you're like oh there's my face <laughs> yeah there we are do you ever you always wonder if the Brady Bunch had um, copyrighted this, like, you yeah. know, the square thing? They would have made a lot of money now. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be over someday. <laughs> yeah. Will it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just say these I, things. I hope I hope so. I'm, I'm doing a talk in person tomorrow evening, though, uh, Oshie, and I'm interviewing Vivian Dick. So yes. It's, it's live. In person, yeah, yeah, yeah. no glass panel or nothing. No, well, like I could ask for one, <laughs> I would just cut like Vivian off like bulletproof that. air holes. <laughs> no. You know what? Whenever I go to Centra, I always think of um, do you remember the Silence of the Lambs? You know, the yeah, of course, he's, he's behind the glass and he's like, yeah. Hello, Clarice. <laughs> and I did this at the start of lockdown, I did this in Centra, I said, Hello, Clarice. <laughs> None of them got it. They didn't find it funny at all. They were probably under enormous stress. <laughs> yeah, they were afraid of dying. <laughs> right, anyway, this is serious, right? This is serious. Serious, serious. <laughs> Silence of the Lambs is actually really good. I rewatched it recently. I really liked it. I it is good. It. It's better it's... than I remember. It is Anthony Hopkins, though, isn't it? Like, yeah. he is, like, he's the guy. And there's just loads of kind of scary shots of them, like... You know, like all of the 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 tunnel the tunnel work is good, and the the dark yeah. corridors and things, you know. Yeah, and I don't, it's just it's a great choice. The like there being no bars between them, so it's a, a clear mm. panel, so you can kind of yeah. go back and forth um, mm. in that kind of like conversation style, which is what yeah. I remember from it. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant, and also like Anthony Hopkins, I think he's really funny in it. Yeah. Like, I don't know, I think he's just trying to be really smart and suave yeah, and this yeah. kind of stuff. And you're like, this guy is so crazy. <laughs> um, but maybe I'm, I'm playing my cards too quickly now in relation to what I find funny. <laughs> but I was Anthony thinking... Hopkins and Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> yeah. The is funny guy. <laughs> I, I did find it funny. But he even makes the joke, he's like, I'm having an old friend for dinner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is classic joke writing. <laughs> Um, Murder, it's classic. <laughs> Cannibalism. Um, Nicole, um, you have prepared a little reading from your wonderful first collection, yeah. Show Them a Good Time. So yes. if you would like to um, just introduce what you're going to read and read it for, for our, our guests, that would be brilliant. And then we'll, yes. we'll How, get going. Uh, like like uh, five minutes? be done would be yeah five okay. minutes whatever feels like a natural pace or finish point for you five minutes is great okay great um i'm gonna read from a story called track um i've actually been reading more than usual i feel like i've done more readings in the last few weeks than i did in the last two years so uh track is 
set in New York and it's about a girl who's living with a comedian, uh, which we can talk about, and she's not having a very good time. Um, and I will start somewhere in the middle. But we started going out. That's where we went wrong. Once summer ended, we got dressed up and went out. That first night before it all became usual, we went somewhere monstrous and glassy. A carpet rolled out like a plush red tongue. Atmospherically, this restaurant was not unlike a morgue in its coldness, and we sat solemnly at a round table as if preparing for a seance. My boyfriend was seated far away from me, almost on a different continent, and he glanced over occasionally to see if I was still upright. He loves me, I thought. I examined the cutlery, my reflection in the cutlery, everyone's reflection in the cutlery. They were so easy to agree with, these well-dressed people. I had a thrilling weightless feeling as if I had taken several painkillers. I remembered that I had taken several painkillers. I understood everything. A woman appeared to me through a fog. So what was it like growing up where you came from, she asked. Was it hard? I had no idea. All my memories were flat green, postcard shaped. My parents, after their less than tender separation, became cartoon parents, fingers wagging into the frame of my life. When I told my friends I was leaving, they said it would be amazing. New York, so amazing. My hometown was a strange place, dressed up as a normal place. It was as if we all lived under a sheet of suffocating plastic. I remembered my fingers trading rental dabs dresses, the rubberness of the dry cleaning. Not many opportunities, I said, for growth. The woman shook her head as if expressing incommunicable pain on my behalf. I smiled. I knew that smile would be the high peak of my enthusiasm for the evening, and I would lay, lay awake in the morning, not as nicely drugged, with a new hate in my heart. That rain-soaked night was the first time we listened to the track. When we returned to the apartment, he produced it as if he was doing me a favour. The track, its black tentacles coiling around two circular empty eye sockets, trapped forever in a 70s-style playback box, was his lucky talisman, a childhood gift from his mother. It was how he learned to hone his routine in the basement of a suburban home, pantomiming for an imaginary audience. His mother was sick and growing up there hadn't been much joy in his house. He pressed play and manic laughter burst from the lips of the H and take. My mother was mentally ill, he repeated, as though he was strangely proud, as if, uh, proud of it, as if it legitimised him. I could have tossed out some scraped together psychology, psychology about his present situation, but what would it have been worth? I imagined the comedian as a child, pirouetting desperately through his act, become, loosening an imaginary adult tie, preparing for a lifetime of being loved. A 12-year-old channeling his frantic and obsessive energy in the basement as the laughter drowned out the sounds from the other world directly above him. When I pictured his parents, I just saw them in regulation smocks, tilling the land, unsmiling. He promised me I was the first woman he had shown the track to. He had dated a lot of girls during his time in New York, some famous, some not, asymmetrical haircuts, cool and indifferent as if it was a career, career requirement. <laughs> he liked to make mean, primitive remarks about his exes. It didn't bother me hugely. Types. The way he said types. I knew that a relationship could fall apart in the utterance of a single word, but that was not our word. I didn't blame him. I was out there, stumbling around too. I was part of the show. Yet that first night when he dropped to his knees and thanked the track for his good fortune and success, I was oddly thrilled. He was a very neat person, tidy and composed, so this display of weakness was rare. As he paced through the bedroom, energetically rubbing his face, the laughter rising and falling, water leaking onto his cheeks like a reflex. I made encouraging sounds. I massaged his back clockwise and anti-clockwise, watched him like an interested viewer. Afterwards, calmed by the noise, he felt moved to explain the different forms of comedy to me, working energetically through its history. At that moment, I have to say this, my chest grew extraordinarily tight and I felt it was very likely that I was going to die. <laughs> Can you hear me, Ashim? I can hear you. I could. Okay. I was listening. <laughs> you can hear me. I was That's, reading. Yeah, it was brilliant. Oh, um, that's been so long. Tracy, could we get on the equal screen thing, if that's possible? Uh, maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. I'm just. I want the equality. You know. <laughs> I agree with the equality. <laughs> You look like my overlord now. Um, <laughs> no, I prefer it this way, actually. <laughs> um, that was, I mean, that's brilliant. That's, I don't know. I think that might be my favorite story of yours I've read. Um, I love the last one, the, the pre-apocalypse one as well. Yeah. Um, 
I suppose in that story track, uh, which has huge amounts of very funny moments, mm-hmm. um, the comedian mm-hmm. is not funny. No. He's terrifying. He's, he's, mm. he's, he's, he's your scariest character. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how did this, this, this mm. come about, this kind of flip? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. And I also, it's been so long since I wrote that story and I don't know if you feel the, the similar kind of relationship with your first your first book of stories, but you're kind of like, gosh, like certainly like after coming back to, to a, after writing the, the novel, I feel like a different person sort of wrote mm. it. But I do remember my inspiration for this story in particular was kind of just like, you know, I read like a lot of stuff about celebrities, but I think that's just, that doesn't mean I'm vacuous. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, you're working and, through it. Yeah, and then you kind of like I'm just not that interested in the like as like celebrity as the actual idea of it, but I am interested in the people that surround a celebrity and you know that like kind of support the fantasy of it, you know. And you know you you do have to have that if if you if you want to make it kind of real. So I'm I'm interested in the people that are next to them, the kind of I treat it badly or you know treat it indifferently and things like that so I, I thought like a girlfriend would be an interesting interesting way to explore this and also I've made her Irish um and new to to New York or whatever which would already gives her that like outsider's perspective you know um but my kind of one of my main inspiration inspirations behind this story was um the king of comedy the, the Scorsese film which yeah. I love yeah. um and I was just thinking like how you train yourself to become a comedian just the concept of, I, I actually don't know many comedians but like the idea of that like being funny is something that you're good at and you're like right i'll do this for my mm-hmm. job i'll do my life and how you you work at that you know um so it takes some incredible amounts of like reinforcements and things like that so yeah that's what i was these are kind of all the ideas behind it you know and then i i, I wanted to use the, the laugh track because um that links nicely to the novel. I'm, I'm just kind of very interested in, in tapes <laughs> and the, like lack of tapes and things like that. There. Um, oh, you've frozen there a bit. Yeah. Or maybe this is me. Yeah. But I, I can still hear you. So I'll ask a long question and maybe you'll unfreeze. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a great <laughs> freezing point. <laughs> um, I suppose with this. I mean, the tape is an interesting idea because the tape is a kind of feedback loop of laughter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he needs this validation of laughter for his ego. And then the people around him to some degree, not they're vacuous, but Mm -hmm. they're empty of something that they need from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, I suppose like when you're like, oh, comedians are, they... Is there something disturbing then about wanting to be funny in this kind of programmatic way? Um, mm-hmm. Do you think, or is it just, am I being too blanket? blanket? I'm totally gone now. I'm, I'm no longer on the screen, um, but I'm here still. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I guess like, you know, I think that we've heard like quite a, f- a number of dark things about comedians, you know, like it seems mm. to take like a lot of energy and I don't know, like I, it's like a, like a cliched thing, but, but behind that laughter is like a dark kind of soul or whatever. But I don't know necessarily if that's true, but that was sort of one of the ideas I was, I was thinking about. I'll stop my video and then I'll restart it maybe. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, like that yeah. was like, as I assume you were writing that before 2019 and there was this kind of idea of power and laughter yeah. and then laughter being kind of like filling a lack and then you using other people's bodies to do it. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I think we'll come back to that in a bit, but it, it's, I mean, I think it's very, I mean, I think you do it very well. And I think what I really liked, I mean, I liked so much about the story, but it wasn't just him. He's being enabled by everything. Mm-hmm. And by the end of it, he's also being enabled by her, which mm-hmm. is, you know, so like mm-hmm. it is an abusive relationship, but there's more symbiosis in it, which mm-hmm. is 
it's just scary and then it becomes even funnier yeah um i do think yeah. that one thing that like in the book that i was working with a lot and was just the idea of fantasy like fantasy you know like in the first book is in the first story in the book that she's working like a fantasy job or whatever and then like you know is there a greater fantasy than like celebrity do you know like it's such mm. a delusion but like yeah people have to participate in that delusion um so yeah i i did ha like there is all these people that surround him and like you know a lot of his laughter and a lot of jokes come from cruelty and things as well so um a lot of, a lot of people around him that he would be making jokes out and they're there for that specific purpose um so yeah i was i was just like thinking like what is another kind of fantasy that you could have you know this, yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> no but it, it is like it's like I'm very dark. i do like jokes <laughs> <laughs> yeah well no but it's definitely worth talking about because like i don't want to go there just yet but this idea of like there are different types of jokes mm -hmm. and there are like there's definitely laughing at suffering which can be really bad you know yeah. in the sense of like yeah. it's actually in the preparation for every genocide there's like a there's a preparation of suffering jokes then it stops being funny and then yeah. it gets serious but like and then there's all this i mean i think when we were sending back articles mm. back and forth uh, mark fisher mm. wrote about uh, the tories and like yeah. the type of humor that would be in these private schools mm. where such a good piece. i hadn't read that before you sent it to me yeah it's he was he's very good a very a very nice writer he mm. he has this which i think is correct i don't agree with his conclusion but his mm. analysis is brilliant which is like there's a, a type of laughter which is regulation mm. mm -hmm. and they've kind of like perfected this in the cruelty yeah. comedy of private schools and you can yeah. kind of see that a bit in your character of uh, the comedian it is mm. like my position in the hierarchy relies upon a type of regulation mm, through mm -hmm. a mean laughter that has mm -hmm. no, this is the part I don't like about it, right? I don't mind laughing at suffering. My issue is that when you laugh at the person laughing at suffering, that's, they're like, no, that's not, <laughs> yeah. you don't do that. Like, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, it doesn't, it doesn't go back. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, and you can even see this. I think there was, now I didn't follow the story so closely, but in England, I think a few months ago, like the BBC were looking into a certain type of joke that was yeah. like disruptive uh, mm. and getting rid of it, which is, this is Ridiculous. just, I mean, it's completely outrageous, but it's not like, yeah, anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that later. I wanted, because there are the, there was the two aspects that I wanted to ask you about mm. Show Them a Good Time, which genuinely is extremely funny and extremely disturbing. And it's hard to separate them at certain points. So the second question I want to ask you about show them a good time is so the comedian is your scariest character and then almost your most traditional comedic piece in the kind mm. of sense of like it being a marriage plot and like you know two people get together and they overcome mm. adversity and they find each other it's called uh, abortion mm. <laughs> so so how did how did well, where does this impulse in you come from this to to flip it again like that you know i think what yeah i think uh i think what you were saying there about like suffering and laughing at suffering i think it's totally fine to laugh at your own suffering <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think that's like that's fully <laughs> that's all yours <laughs> yeah. um, that abortion love story came about because and i also didn't like i didn't think that story would be as funny as it, as it was at the start because i i knew i was gonna write about it but like and we can talk about this in relation to your own work too but like I knew I wanted to write like a sort of theater piece play thing um because I like the theater very much and uh I wanted to set something in that kind of world and then that's just the, the story just grew and grew and grew and got longer and longer but also like I do enjoy <laughs> laughing at things that aren't supposed to specifically be funny because a lot of that discomfort is where the the, the comedy arises um and it's just something like so and this is just something I like and I know I write it a lot um but there's just something so funny about someone just being totally clueless <laughs> like, like the girls and uh, like abortion like one of them is like doesn't know where the, like anything in college is like there's just like some, <laughs> as about someone 
like just not knowing what is going on, like just being like a little bit out of step with the rest of the world, but it will always be like entertaining to me, not like in a Mr. Bean way, <laughs> although Mr. Yeah. Bean can be good, <laughs> like, but like just in a very, even in very small ways, like, uh, yeah. I think that's, I think that's so good. And you really, I mean, like when I, when I read you like that, that, that story, um, yeah. there's this kind of getting a bit technical, but there's this guy called Henri Bergson, who uh, a French philosopher, and he had a theory of the comic, which was a lot of comedy comes from the human's encroachment. This is, sorry, I'm going to get boring, but anyway, the human's <laughs> encroachment upon the mechanical or the mechanical encroaching upon the human. So like, mm -hmm. this is like Charlie Chaplin. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have, he's a tramp. He's mm -hmm. navigating these huge systems. Mm -hmm. Same thing with like Jacques Tati. Like they're just wandering around like an office, not having any idea what's yeah. going on. And you mm -hmm. do, you bring it up, but you do what is the, I mean, you do what I consider to be the comedic duty, which is you update it, which is like wandering around like an abortion <laughs> office or fucking a university being like, yeah. <laughs> What's going on? So but that's because like and i i actually i i watched the jack tati film for the first time just like last week i watched playtime and i do think that like there's something uh yeah like i just find like in my own personal life i just find so many like things like sort of confusing and like buildings in particular like even i remember like trying to go on the dole and things and like anything that is just sort of that kind of way is just sort of funny to me and then like you know like I think comedy like we're talking about is also power in some kind of ways so like you're like oh like I had to go like I'm on the door now but like I couldn't find the office and I couldn't find like that that's the friend like that's the story you go in with to the like, like pub and they're like oh like she's fine so comedy can be this like powerful thing that it can when in your when you use it in that way too you know like I said like you could Laugh at yourself, you know? Yeah, I think like it is that it's like this kind of wandering nature. And I wish yeah. there was more like it of this mm -hmm. kind of like, because what you've described there, wandering through the dole office, that could be Kafka as well. You know what I mean? Like there's that, like it could just be like, this is literally yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. Or <laughs> it can just be like, you know, this kind of like wandering around, not having a clue. I mean, I had it recently in a haircut. Uh, yeah. this haircut is not a haircut I wanted at all <laughs> it never is is it <laughs> so the gym I went to yeah. they were like they because they've taken such a hit from COVID they started renting out different rooms and they gave gym memberships uh, they gave them a discount to a haircut so obviously everyone in the audience knows don't get a discount haircut <laughs> this is what you, don't, you don't do it so um we all I, was wandering around the, I was wandering around the gym in a shirt and, and black trousers, for like, you know, which is not what you do in a gym. Everyone's like nearly naked, all beautiful. And anyway, I'm like so relieved when I get to this back room that used to be the yoga room and they're now doing haircuts. And he goes, you know, he's a Brazilian guy. Now I taught English and I would say he had a B1 level of English, <laughs> but I didn't know that at the time. So he says, what do you want? And I say... Uh, just shorter on the sides and the top, but don't use the razor. So I lean back, close my eyes. Zzzz, <laughs> mm. And I open my eyes, the razor is going. And I was like, this is completely fair, right? It's completely <laughs> fair. Like, hey, I said it like, you know, with an Irish accent, like don't do the razor, but now I'm just getting a razor to my head. Mm -hmm. And I had this huge sadness because I yeah. couldn't go to the pub and tell people. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's i don't know but it is like this this kind of negotiation of systems sorry it i went off on to negotiate a system like like and I like with your haircut or like i think there's like great like obviously and i have this too and it's such like an irish thing to be like you cannot tell someone what you want or if someone is doing what you don't want them to do it like I would rather die than tell them, you know. Like, and that gap is also like where the comedy arises because, like, I was like, of course he, like, the comedian would be American, and of course she'd be Irish because he would be so direct and like getting what he wants, and like she would be so 
the opposite. So I think there's like such a comedy and, and, and politeness as well. Mm. This, well, this is, isn't this like the comedy of manners? Mm. So like mm -hmm. the kind of like the old idea of like the 16th century, 17th century, like we mm. do kind of have this in Ireland of, you know, kind of like everything is unspoken to a certain mm -hmm. degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I find this very, a lot of the Irish comedy I don't like, they're, they're just saying the thing. Yeah. That's happening. Yeah. <laughs> that's big these days. <laughs> what? I know. What yeah. do you think? So, well, we'll, we'll do a bit of, we won't gossip too much, but like, what, what do you think there's like, do you think there's a problem with comedy? And I'm not talking about culture wars or something like this, but there's in people being funny. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not. Being We're not talking about those Netflix specials where it's someone being like canceled. <laughs> Triggered. And they have the yellow tape over their mouth. You know? <laughs> Offended think, question mark. Well, my own kind of thoughts on this is like, as well, like, and I think that's why, it's why and I, I like, I, I'd like to know how, if you felt similar. Like, I think that like, I could be a little freer in my short stories as regards comedy because the point of a short story is like almost nothing happens. I'm like, that's mm. such a, like such a good, like starting point for comedy. Like I feel like most of my, if not all of my favorite comedies, like nothing happens, nothing ever changes. Like, and that is the whole kind of point of it, you know? And it's just like, that it keeps repeating, repeating, repeating. And I find that like just kind of more difficult, well, to pull off in a novel, certainly, but I, I just wonder if like right now, like as the way things are, you know, like there's so much productivity in capitalism and things like that, you know, capitalism is bad. Oh, sure. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah, it's it's been getting a bad rap lately. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I just wonder is like people like, the, are we like scared of the nature of like, just like had like, like real dullness and stuff. Like if I think of something like Father Ted, like they're never getting off that island. They're no. staying there forever. Whereas like everything now has to show some kind of progression and like progression and achieving things just aren't funny. <laughs> Whereas no. failure and status are very funny, you know? It's like, yeah, it's kind of like, isn't it? In some sense, it's like they have to learn a lesson. I remember when Scrubs yeah. came out when I was a kid and at the end he kept learning shit. I was like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I think that's very true. Yeah, because I feel like, you know, culture these days feels like, and all of it, book films, like it feels like it has to be instructive in some way. And yeah. like comedy has suffered for that reason, because it really, really should not be instructive. Like if you think of like Curb Your Enthusiasm, that guy's just a big, rude idiot. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And that's like, you'll never change. You'll never learn. I have the opposite reading of that, Nicole. I really? feel he's the only good one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm terrified by everyone who surrounds him. You know this yeah. kind of set, but this idea of nothing happening, where so like yeah. there is like the sitcom, you know. And I mean, I like you know, for me, the funniest writer of all time is Charles Dickens. Like just hands down, he's just the funniest. And he gets the notion of characters not changing, and like mm -hmm. they have catchphrases and they keep coming back and they keep yeah. coming back. And this nothingness, I don't know, like. You mentioned capitalism, you know what I mean? Mm. But are you saying like, pr like we, there's like, we there's too much production? There's not enough yeah. time? What? Yeah. Yeah, well, I definitely think that that's probably like, I don't know, like I think about, and we were talking about this over email, but I think about like my favorite comedies, which I was saying that like I would have watched with like my dad or like wh whoever, and you know, we both find them funny and things. Whereas I do feel like there's this like generational <laughs> shift in humor. Like you go on like Twitter and everyone's like, ah, this funny video. And you're like, what in God's name is that? Like, okay, boomer. I feel, <laughs> and I feel so old. But like, I just feel like that kind of, and then like once you transfer, like, transfer that kind of like front facing like comedy satirical videos or whatever that is to like an actual like half an hour long comedy which they seem intent on doing that like giving these people these it just never works because it, it just isn't the idea isn't strong enough or mm. like I said there's this like desire for everything to be zany and stuff and I don't think it works when when someone isn't the straight man you know 
Well, I think now this to me, what you've said there is the profound point of whatever is happening now is people are all terrified of being laughed at in a way yeah. they don't want to be laughed at. <laughs> so like, if you look at the big victors of the mm. current era, now this is going to get too political to me, but they're the people who are able to be laughed at. Yeah. So like, all this zaniness, all this irony mm. poisoning, all this going one step ahead, all this like, what about this and this, all this kind of like mocking other people. People are terrified of being laughed at. Mm. In a way, I feel they weren't in the past. Mm. Like you always mm. have to be one up. So like, comedy needs norms mm. and then people to transgress them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you need this normal person mm -hmm. to whom yeah. things happen and nobody is willing to stand up and mm. fall down you know <laughs> you know and i don't know it's it's it's, it's I, I don't it's it's i it makes me uneasy because these things comedy you know you're talking about the generational shift mm. i see definitely from like the restoration comedies in london i see a direct mm. through line in european comedies mm. And like whatever is happening now, it's I don't mm. know what it's I don't know. Mm. I don't know. There's something there's some fear of comedy, I think, is happening mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you I think you kind of touch on it in a nice way in your work because there's always the the comedian to me in your work, he's terrified of being laughed at, I would say. Yeah. That would be Yeah. In a know. way that he can't control. Yeah, it's like hyper controlling, you know. What if, yeah. I don't know. I'm going to ask. I don't know if you can answer this, but what what's go, what, what's all this control? What's this need for this control? <laughs> I don't know. Like I, I I don't. Do you think like in a the? Oh, I think one problem is like, and I think I can only say this about novels, possibly or or, or books generally. I'm like, how to phrase this? I I think that like you know there is this intention which I actually don't feel at all because I could never work hard enough at it but like to be desired to be taken seriously you know and the only way to be taken seriously is to write completely seriously and like no one is meant to be laughing or even thinking about laughing while reading your book or your masterpiece because you know you're imparting lessons and you're you're writing wrongs and you know and I think that people are like that's the only way I I can do things, you know, that's the only way I win awards or whatever, like, well, like, it's sort of a, a boring position. I'm not saying that novels are less funny than they are. There's lots of funny novels and things, of course there is, but like, I feel like that shades of like light and dark, because nothing is ever one way. And I don't know if you feel the same way as me, but I often find my, <laughs> my own misery very funny. Like, yeah. <laughs> I remember when I was trying to finish this book, the, the stories, I was like, oh, I can't finish the last story. And talking to a friend of mine and she was just like oh you're you're the best when you're the most unhappy you need to get like a bad job and you need like terrible relationship but just do it like in the next two weeks and you'll finish the story and I was like great great <laughs> so, we gotta find a better way this has to I mean I think the way my suffering you know because we're a bit older now you know and I feel like I've been suffering for so long or something you know but sometimes you're just like here I go again. You know? mm, yeah. <laughs> it's like, so you're like seeing yourself suffering and then you're a comedic figure because yeah. it's like, it's like, it's not your first rodeo. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't, so the, the idea of suffering, which is, I think it's very valorized now. And I mean, I really, I want to be careful here because I, there's different types of suffering. There's obviously mm. Trauma and this kind of thing, but then there's also a valorization of trauma, whereby you freeze the suffering forever, and the suffering is what's real. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. okay, I'm gonna I'll, I'll I'm gonna tell a little story now, and I hope it links in in a kind of way. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if it was, but around 2017 or 20, 2018, when like fucking shit wasn't going well for me. I was like, who? What kind of person do I want to be? And like, you know, I had all the, all these heroes in the past, and then I was kind of trying to go back to my to what I really believed in. And I was kind of like, I believe in, in Bugs Bunny. You know, I actually believe in like Bugs Bunny. And now, <laughs> I do. And now, you know, I'm a, I'm a high class person, Nicole. I'm not talking about Space Jam. You know, I'm talking about the 30s, 
40s. I'm not one of these man children millennials. I'm a I'm a I'm an intellectual, you know? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. But the Bugs Bunny thing, so I was thinking he 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 needles power, like he's always annoying power, but it's not like he's not a revolutionary, he's just like always overcoming. And then when you watch it again, and I mean it's silly, it's a children's program, but mm. It never stops. Like he never stops suffering, then overcoming, mm. then he's suffering again, then he's over. And it's mm. always this kind of thing, you know, and Elmer Fudd is always winning and Bugs Bunny is kind of winning. And it always changes and changes and changes and changes. And I think there's something so true mm. in this, which I think we knew in the past, but now it's like this very, very, very serious. And now yeah. it's, you know, and it's, I, I th but I even that trajectory you're describing there, like it's the same as like the office, like David Brown, the office, like it's someone keep, they, they have a small amount of power and they keep trying to get more power, but they'll never get. And then like, and the, the part you have, the impulse you have to admit is like of, as a viewer, is to be like, you don't want them to. <laughs> you <laughs> want to see them not get it. <laughs> so do we, I'm going to, I'm challenging you here. I am going to, I'm challenging you. I don't know, Nicole, it kind of sounds like you're laughing at someone else's suffering. <laughs> Me? God, no. Never. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sitting not... in my house. Candles lit. I know. <laughs> Suffer. Candles lit, like, blown out by the hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you a question, which was um, something that I've been thinking about, particularly in relation to my own work, um, is that like would you do you feel freer in your in your short stories do you feel like you have more room to to be funny do, do, do you feel like the novel form is like in a, a like a quite serious form like because I, that is something that i like i kind of struggled with on that like definitely my first draft like i was like reading through it being like oh this is very dark very heavy mm. but like no moments of levity and now i think i've, I've relaxed and, and there is more but like, do you find that at all? Because you've done, you've done both, you know? I, I think it's, I like that question. Mm -hmm. I think we kind of like, I mean, drawing a comparison between mm -hmm. us, I think it's like, we're always doing the other thing. So like, mm -hmm. if there's a tragic scene, you're like, what if this was light? And then if yeah. there's like, if there's like a happy scene where a boy yeah. and a girl are together, you're like, what if this is mm -hmm. the tragedy? You know what I mean? And these kind of things emerge, but I, I always have like, they're always gifts jokes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like they're like, yeah. they're like little things, they happen mm -hmm. and you have a character and you think they're one thing mm -hmm. and then they give you something else. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, and sometimes you're like, oh, he really shouldn't be funny here. This, mm -hmm. is really, this yeah. really isn't gonna play. But then you've got to say like, what, where is truth? coming mm. from you know is mm. truth coming from this like it's it's funny now and then it's horrific mm. again and then it's mm. funny again I'm gonna throw this question back to you actually because I have a my relationship with comedy is whenever I try to be funny mm. it doesn't work as you can probably yeah. tell by you know from the times we've hung out <laughs> but, oh. <laughs> but but then something kind of magical will happen. Yeah. But because of the way we work in the medium we work, mm. we're not tweeters, you know? Mm. I have to look at this fucking joke for the next two years. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, how do you sit with your mm. jokes? Do you like, cause I have these jokes and it's like, they're magic. You know, when you tell a funny story mm -hmm. and it's really funny. And then the next time you tell it, it's just not funny. Yeah. I well, have yeah. like, how do you keep this magic? Especially with something like a joke in a in a manuscript form for so long you know yeah that's a great question and i like what you were saying about like we we're you know if you look at something and you're like like the sad moment should be funny and the 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 funny moment should be sort of sad you know and i really agree with that and it was definitely something when i was like writing the book that i was i was thinking about you know like i i was like how can i write these kind of cliched situations and like just change one thing slightly so in abortion love story she's having an affair with this older man but i was like what if she was just like a nightmare <laughs> like, <laughs> the worst woman on earth and she was just torturing him <laughs> but like i as i was, I was like just tweaking things like 
kind of kind of slightly but the the funny thing is like you know and i know this from like doing so many readings and reading that book so much now like you can be in one audience and you get loads of laughs when you read something and you can be in another and you're just like oh uh -huh. so it's, it's a very like humor is a very uh, personal kind of thing you know it's it's very different and it changes in and day to day and there could be sometimes i'd read things and i'd be like that's funny and and, and then other days i would read it and be like nah, not so yeah. much you know so i guess it's yeah which impulse are you true to do you mm -hmm. i know it's it's kind of the question of editing is actually yeah. the question of writing and mm -hmm. i don't know i don't know i, I never, feel i never go into a scene and i'm like this should be funny or how do i make this make this funny but i think something i i like now i kind of find funny uh, and when i'm reading and stuff like the gap between like somebody wanting like the gap between someone's desires and like what they get yeah. do you know what i mean yeah. um and like excess yeah, and that's lack. something i come back to a lot <laughs> excess yeah. and lack it's just so funny yeah. i don't know it's yeah. like i don't know there's and always because you know we're a very more society mm. you know yeah. everything must be more even yeah. when we have less it's like a more thing yeah. and i mean this will never stop being funny mm -hmm. you know yeah. this kind of thing like yeah. like the thing of like someone being clueless in institutions that are too mm -hmm. large mm -hmm. or too big for them yeah um people wanting more and not mm -hmm. getting it mm. you know folks funny in his carrots you know it's like <laughs> bringing it back to <laughs> Can I can I ask you a question? Which is is comedy important to you in your reading? Like, would you be frustrated with a book if if you felt it wasn't funny or it didn't have something uh, humor about it, or does it not bother you? Well, I've been I've totally given up on contemporary <laughs> literature to be funny. Not yeah. like no, not in a broader sense. Is like the only humor that's acceptable is so narrow. Mm -hmm. whereby it's the like I'm getting ahead of what mm -hmm. you think of me and that's the yeah. one joke you never have like I remember there's even a bit in I think it was like when I was rereading your stuff for this interview like you have a bit where like someone falls over something and I was like I haven't read anyone falling over, joke. falling over in years yeah. I just in years it hasn't happened mm -hmm. um I don't know I I'd be a bit like you. It's like you go you go to the movies for mm. for the humor. But what I will say is as a writer, it is impossible for me to maintain a serious tone beyond yeah. 5,000, 10,000 words. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I can't, this yeah. is my life. I'm here every day. I can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't do it. You yeah. know? So in that kind of sense, as long as I'm producing it, mm. I'm happy. I genuinely don't expect it from anyone anymore yeah. and that's just like what it is now you know I think that when I was first started kind of like reading like seriously you know I didn't really know what I was reading for and I liked whatever I was told to like and then only when I read writers like you know Kevin Barry or Colin or, or whoever and I found like American writers like Laurie Moore or Deborah Eisenberg I realized like what I had been missing so I mm. think that I never kind of went looking for it but I, when I found and I was like, oh, no, they're right. <laughs> you know, like yeah. what they're doing is like correct. Like this is the, the tone I've been I've been missing, you know. It is. It's kind of magical in Ireland to have that, which is yeah. especially in the short story. There's the kind of voice literature. And I know yeah. you're a big fan of this country. And mm. um, yeah, yeah. I'd be, I, yeah, I'd be a huge <laughs> fan of Hardy books. And then there's this kind of trailer park boys. Yeah. And there is definitely this kind of comedy, which is very character based and yeah. very kind of not improv, improv, but it's more like mm -hmm. the people reacting within their own character yeah. to everything. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we have it in Ireland still. Mm -hmm. um, I hope it lasts, yeah. but you've got to be very yeah. careful, you know, because it's not easy because like mm -hmm. when people play up the Irishness, mm -hmm. Oh, it falls so flat. I know, you know, and it can it can be it can be very it can be very bad, but there's a certain subtle comedy to the short story. I actually was doing a a, a weeding a real weeding. A reading I was doing a weeding with, with Bugs Bunny the Wabbit. 
<laughs> the books, yeah. <laughs> God, be great. I was like, you keep wanting things and you can't get them. <laughs> um, but no, I did a reading with Wendy Erskine. And she was reading from one of her stories, which is like sat in a cafe. And it's about like, once again, that one, like this cafe is set up. People are going into it expecting to like have like a bun and a, uh, like a nice coffee. And like, that's the other thing. <laughs> like people are so like tetchy about like how they spend their money and things. Like if you're going into like a specific, like a nice restaurant or like a, a nice cafe, you want to have like a good time. And that righteous anger is just like sometimes like just so hilarious to watch. But anyway, some character sees like uh, it's, uh, people work there having sex in the toilet. And I was like, that is such a good set of <laughs> story. Like that's such a comedy setup. It's great, you know. <sighs> Yeah. That kind of like that kind of thing still like situational comedy still makes me like laugh so much. Um, yeah. yeah. What what were your favorite comedies you watched growing up? I think. I thought I was doing the interview. Thing. No. <laughs> I've, I've changed. <laughs> I I kind of I have to be a bit careful because I am uncomfortable with it now. But in the same way you know, a certain type of person would mm. arrive at a certain place in their life and they would mm. quote a passage from the Bible. Yeah. I would do this with The Simpsons. Yeah. Uh, where I would say, I don't know, I would like, something would happen to me in my life and I would be like, this is like when Bart gets a girlfriend. Yeah. Now, <laughs> this is like, and I, it, it was this kind of thing you were saying of comfort and stasis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have had this, the mm. Simpsons was always my comfort. Now, I've become a bit more uncomfortable with that, I don't know, recently. But then what I've also loved is I've also loved the madness, the mm. absolute, just kind of like insanity. And mm. like, I mean, the Marx Brothers had it, South Park mm. had it for me, where you're just mm. like, where did, you know, what is this, you know, mm. coming from? Um but I know I like it all. You know, I really mm. do like it all. Like I was even I've been watching a lot of films from the 1940s where it's all about yeah. like, you know, one <laughs> yeah, guy yeah. is mixed up with another guy and they go out with the wrong women and they kind of do this. And I, I really I love it all. And sometimes I think. Some of the things when we're laughing at them, I think something so profound is going on that I can't mm. explain. Like. Sometimes I just think like you know, a French person trying to speak English or an English person trying to speak French. Like, I just, I wonder when this will stop being funny. Like in what generation will it stop? You know what I mean? I, and then like, I suppose going back to an earlier point okay. with you, with my little brother, mm. when he was a baby, I would take a teddy bear and I would smash it. And I'd go, ah, and he would lose his shit laughing, right? Mm. He was like, before language, before anything, he would mm. just laugh. And then I would do it with my sister before she had any language. Mm. And she just didn't find it funny. <laughs> she's, just like, <laughs> she's just like, yeah, no, not for me. She yeah. was like six months old. Mm -hmm. So even this stuff, even the comedy I don't find funny now, mm. or that doesn't make me laugh, I still admire mm. it more than I admire a lot of other stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I think yeah. comedy can work and not be funny. Same thing with horror. Yeah, 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 no, I agree. And also, like, yeah, I watched so much Simpsons when you were growing up, and I feel like our whole generation did, and, like, it definitely has, like, influenced us in, in, in that kind of way. But I remember um, and something else that I also find very funny, which is, like, it's just, like, impotent anger. When someone's just angry, and they can't do anything with that. <laughs> I mean, like, that is sort of the way we've all been feeling, like, for the last year and a half. But I've, I watched a lot of, and also, like, probably cancelable, cancelable now and probably is, but like I watched a lot of Faulty Towers with like my, my dad and stuff growing this, up. And like, this dress. <laughs> 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 I did. And like, I, I just remember thinking, That's, he's so angry. It's, it's so funny. <laughs> I don't, do something about like seeing a man like that that's like absolutely loses shit that would like never not be hilarious to me. <laughs> it is, it's so funny and it, but it's also... I mean, and I think we kind of like we said this at the kind of start, but it's yeah. also horror because like The yeah. Shining yeah. is a man who's angry. Yeah. yeah. But Faulty Towers is a man who's angry. Mm, but yeah. also, I mean, In The Shining hotel. is really funny. I think The Shining is like, 
mean, there, Jack Nicholson is funny in The Shining, but like, I mean, but it is the thing. Like, I mean, for me, horror and comedy are the closest. Yeah, I think You know so. what I mean? Like in terms of like, you're going for a physical reaction. There's a very high skill set involved. And then also it doesn't work. So like, mm -hmm. for me, um, one of the scariest things I've ever seen was uh, Hereditary. It's the only mm. film that scared me in the last five, six, seven years. Mm. I show that to people, zero effect. I have to say now, Oshin, I had a good laugh through Hereditary. It is <laughs> funny. My sister took me to see that and she had already seen it and she knew the ending was coming. And she kept being like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know this is going to be good. <laughs> I think that like one thing I, I I always think about it in like in short fiction is like I don't know like comedy can do this like and perhaps you find this too like I think like I think it was like a Kevin Barry Liner says some, something he said once like if you kind of make them laugh in the first paragraph you can kind of do anything which is like true you know you've set up what like seems like a sort of comedic situation and then you said like you can turn that into horror like you can kind of, you know, just just with like a couple of lines, make the situation much weirder and stuff because you've gotten, you've yeah. made them comfortable. And once you've yeah. made, made someone comfortable, you can kind of do anything you want, you know? It is, I feel, I think, I think you're, I mean, mm. the, the reason I am such a fan of yours is because, mm. I mean, I think you're very, I won't compliment you, okay? But I think, <laughs> I think you, I think you, there's obviously complexity and there's a real panache to your voice, but I think you are doing this thing that we have done for a mm. long time, whereby you're saying, I get them, mm. and then I tighten it. And mm. for people to not use laughter in this mm -hmm. way in literature, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you're really, it's like going into a fight with one hand tied behind mm. your back. I mm. really don't... I mean, I don't see the world that way myself. I, mm. My personality is someone who finds things funny, mm. but I don't understand how, and I read a lot of young people's stuff and you know, they have so much talent and they have mm. so much knowledge and they have so much awareness, mm -hmm. but they're, it's like they're afraid of mm. this huge tool that a writer has. I don't know. I, I, I really agree with that though. And I really, I, I, I can fully, I was the exact same. I was like really scared to try anything like humorous anything and I remember I did the MA in in, in Trinity and I handed in my <laughs> my first story and I was like 23 or something and I was so like I, I had worked so long in this session like it was like my my like big important story and everyone was gonna <laughs> yeah <laughs> you'd be a big star <laughs> <laughs> I was like oh. I hope everyone in my class isn't jealous. <laughs> yeah. I'll probably have to break up with my boyfriend. There'll be someone hotter. <laughs> and then Mary Morris, who was like, she's like, it's very funny, Nicole, because she was my, and I was like, oh my God. I was mortified. I, was, I did not want it to be that way. And I think it was a probably only funny because I, I didn't want it, want it to be that way, you know? And then she was like, you should, you should use that. And I was like, okay. Okay, now I think that that's a useful thing. But I also feel like we're talking about kind of anecdotally, like, you know, you talk to your friends and you make kind of like situations that were probably pretty awful seem like entertaining. Yeah. I've definitely used that as like a tool. And like, I feel like, like I wrote this essay before about like getting fired and things like that. And like, once I kind of did that, I kind of like exercised the... Yeah. the the, the situation like from me in, in, in some ways I'm sure other people who write comedy seriously you know feel feel similarly about that you know I think I think that's it I actually think I'm not saying like laughter is therapy because mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to put it in that but I what yeah. I would say for me is every major change in my life mm -hmm. that was either chosen or unchosen mm. but the change not the thing that happens but the change mm -hmm. in me it's me finding something funny that wasn't funny before. It's yeah. like a new kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it is a process. I, it's like a rupture. And you it's all, mm -hmm. like you don't want to laugh, but it's taken mm -hmm. a part of your personality away from you. And now you're this. Well, this thing. is the thing. Like when you're not allowed, like I went to an all girls uh, Catholic uh, secondary school. And like there'd be so many situations. Like, 
like I remember like you know we were not allowed to laugh like I remember a friend of my mine she was like the year below me and they had like a sex ed talk and stuff and then like the nuns would be like so serious like during this we had nuns like yeah. she was a like, girl sitting beside yeah. her was pregnant and it's just like the situation is ridiculous like but like I think that whole like and I use the Catholic thing too like that whole like not laughing during mass like not laughing yeah or, or laughing when you're not supposed to is just like such a such a thrill still such a thrill to me <laughs> but this is where I mean, I don't, we should probably, it is the thrill and it's so, oh, it's so thrilling. I love it so much. Like, and I fear that there, like, you know, I, not culture war, but there is a war. Like, I mean, there's people who are like, you know, they're just laughing at people and you're like, that's not yeah. very sophisticated. But what there is, is like. I actually, find, I find that very uncomfortable uh, online. I, I, I find that. Like, just laughing, just laugh. And it's like, but there's no. Like, so there's, a, this is my, it's not my theory, but I got it kind of from like Alank, Alenka Zupancic, which is that it has to be like, even the idea of punch up, punch down is, is probably mm -hmm. wrong because you're introducing verticality, mm -hmm. which means like you're already establishing a kind of frozen hierarchy. Yeah. So it has to be like, for me, it has to be me and you, you know what I mean? It's like, you're silly, but I'm the si I'm silly mm -hmm. in this way, you know, and this kind of thing going back and forth. And what I think with this thing of things not being so funny, making them even funnier, I worry sometimes that the more things we say aren't funny, mm. the funnier they become in a bad yeah, yeah. way as well as yeah, in a yeah. good way. You know, so like yeah. the fact that like there's a pregnant woman in the sex ed class. I remember in my sex ed class, like the hardest lad put up his hand when we got a picture <laughs> of a penis. He's like, it's not that shape, is it? <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 but anyway but so that's funny but then also there is like because we couldn't joke about it in other contexts the girl mm -hmm. is pregnant you know what yeah. i mean like she is a teenager now going into mm -hmm. this completely new experience without yeah. ever having spoken about these things you know so it's kind How of that ever have gotten this like you know she got it like several years too late this whole conversation yeah. <laughs> ideas you know <laughs> yeah so yeah i don't I'm, I think that that's like, these things can be like judged both ways, but um, I had to ask, not to ask, but to say earlier what you were saying about like Mark Fisher was saying about like kind of satire and like that kind of boarding school humor and like very like Tory humor and things like that, and I think it like it's kind of scary the way the way that article that essay he wrote has just like kind of come true or come even yeah. more true like I never really thought of like humor as like a sinister thing it's like firming you up for something but like yeah like I, I, I can see I can see that now you know in, in ways that I couldn't before mm. yeah. well I think it does I mean I think about this a lot because uh, I find Boris Johnson and Donald Trump mm. to be funny like I think yeah. they position themselves as comedians like yeah. And they're kind of going into that thing is like, I think the victor is the one who is laughed at. So they are buffoons, like they're total yeah. clowns. Yeah. And they're willing to be like, they're not like. They're bulletproof. You can yeah. keep laughing and that's yeah. it. Like it's that yeah. you keep laughing and it doesn't touch them. We're all terrified of being laughed at, putting a foot mm -hmm. wrong. And they, they know that there is a huge amount of unsayable material. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, what? Look, I just said it. And everyone mm -hmm. laughs because mm -hmm. laughter is always to some degree no, not all laughter. There is the laughter of like just pre-genocide laughter, mm. which is ha ha, they're different. Ha ha, they're so stupid. Mm. But laughter is also like there's this repressed thing that you're dealing with information in a new way. Mm -hmm. And they know this and mm. they're doing, they're saying all the conversations we're not having. And mm. they're saying the things we, I don't know. It's, I don't know. I how it's, it's like kind of like that guy in the pub that like, you know, like once you establish the rules very early, you can get away with so much, you know, you're just like, because that's the person you are. Like, I've, I've, I feel like I've experienced that so, so much in my life. Someone being like, oh, that's just like them. Yeah. And, Haha, they're funny because they say these things. And I think that's just <laughs> that, but like on an interglobal kind of kind of scale, you know. But we must be voting for them. Yeah. We must. What do you think the appeal of that is? Then? Like, I don't, 
I don't know. I won't get into that. We won't get into that. But definitely, I do think it's definitely humor is now the thing. So there is like comedians are now frequently saying things aren't funny, that it's not OK to laugh at things. And then these big kind of middle aged men with different ideas are saying, actually, this is really funny. Mm. And people must be agreeing. They mm. have to be. This is the only way these changes in the life. Mm. I mean, the idea that someone mm. like Boris Johnson is the prime minister, mm. if you, that is a, that's funny. Like <laughs> five years ago, you would have been like, what? <laughs> this is yeah. insane. Like this is totally yeah. new. Well, it's not, I mean, Berlusconi, I, I remember Berlusconi. Now, not George Bush, he said silly things. You remember he used to say things like, uh, it's, <laughs> it's time for earth to enter the solar system. He would say things like this. <laughs> But one thing I did, I, one thing you can also say that like, you know, like comedy certainly like enabled like Trump and like yeah. Johnson, you know, like, you know, Trump was on SNL. Jesus, that show's not funny. <laughs> that's something that I think of when I'm like, oh God. Like, I think that's the other thing that like, how did, how did, like, I think that a lot of comedy now is just like, like sketches about stuff that happened last week but with like a slightly higher pitched tone. Yeah, faster. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's like it can't keep pace with the absurdity, absurdity of everyday life. So it just adds in like people screaming or something like that kind of comedy is just like, it's, it's not for me at all. It's, a, it's, a, it's, I mean, this is the analysis I yeah. have of it is it's just a river of shit. Like it's just <laughs> an endless river of shit. It never stops. It never stops advertising to you. It never stops reflecting on the thing five seconds ago. Mm -hmm. If you miss a week, you may as well be, you know, a child, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, it just never stops. And then these people can ride that wave. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So like Boris Johnson rides the wave of have I got news for you shit. Like he's just, yeah. he's like surfing it. And you can Which laugh. Is, it's him. also a sort of, it, it's also very smug. Do you know, like that is like uh, that like kind of smug humor, which is just so off-putting as well. You know, <laughs> Can, like, on a on a lighter on a lighter. Yeah, note. we'll, we'll uh, have to finish up soon, poor. Yeah. But yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. Ask, interview me. Ask me another question, Nicole. <laughs> we'll go to questions. Time. If you have any questions, put them in the chat bar, and we'll get to them. We'll go uh, through all your fan mail. Do so. you find me? Hmm. What writers do you find funny? Like what like books would you have read in the last while? And you're like, ah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm I'm okay boomer, but it's yeah. it I read Charles Dickens mm -hmm. with such pleasure. Like mm. I can't express and I read the same scenes again and again yeah. and again. I just I think they're so wonderful. Like mm. But this is what I like. So uh, there's lots of good comedy, I think, from Ireland, you know. Mm. Um, but, like, it might not make me laugh, but it's good. Mm. Mm. But the ones who, like, really make me laugh. The last one who really made me laugh was a guy called uh, Charles Portis. Oh, have I don't you, know. Have you heard of him? Well, he wrote, I mean, his big one would be True Grit, which was a Coen Brothers Oh, film. yes. No, I have yeah. heard of him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's his, that's an incredible book. But all his other books are just like, I think you'd love them. They're like these mm. oddball characters going on journeys through America. So like I read mm. one of his books called Norwood and like in the first 10 pages, this guy, he's never been to a town before and he mm. sees a guy dressed up as a peanut advertising peanuts. And he just goes over and he interviews, he's, he's talking to the guy and he's like, how much do they pay you? And he's like, oh, this much. And he's like, do you get any free peanuts? And he's like, look, man, <laughs> I just walk up and down with the sign. He's like, would you not talk to me? He's like, and he's like chasing the peanut down the street. Okay, I would, yeah, enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What do you like? What's, who are, who's the, who's the ones for you? Who's the ones for me? So like I said, like I think Kevin and Barry and Colin are very funny. Um, I always, uh, I always find Laurie Moore very funny. Deborah Eisenberg is someone that I, I only read recently that I was like, oh, she's great. Um, Nathaniel West. Have you read any, any? I think I was saying you should read, read his book. Not the Nathaniel Scarlet Letter guy. Who am I thinking of? No. Is it Nathaniel West? Or... No, you're he probably wrote... right. I probably don't know. Let me think. I think it's him anyway. Um, 
and yeah I, i'm trying to think of think of some more um how do those um more um how do laurie moore and, and and eisenberg how do they differ from our local heroes kevin and colin <laughs> like what is there a different type of comedy happening there I think something like Deborah Eisenberg is just very funny in that, like her exchanges, like the actual, like, like the dialogue back and forth, like the, the she's got a great story about a kind of youngish um, girl that goes out, has a boyfriend, he's a drug dealer and she they meet an actor and they go back to the ho hotel room and just the kind of like they're all high in the hotel room and they're just kind of like talking back and forth and just like the she I think she has a theater background so like the pacing is just like great you know like so much of yeah. like so much comedy is in the pacing so much of it yeah. is in the actual dialogue you know um so yeah I think she's I think she's really really great and then like Laurie Moore just has these incredible paragraphs that I feel just like just build to a punchline that yeah. I like I, I don't even know how she how she really does it. Someone else that I like a lot is uh, Patricia Lockwood, and I, I really liked her memoir a lot, and I really like her criticism because I think it's quite kind of hard to be funny in criticism. Something else that something that people go to and expect it to be very dry in a certain yeah. way. So I think when you, someone pulls off something different, you're very very impressed in that in that you know. Yeah, I think I also yeah. find uh, Gwendolyn Riley very funny. And um, people be like, "What's oh, so bleak?" You know, it's always raining, and people are miserable, and they're all dying, whatever. And I'm like, it's so. <laughs> I love it already. <laughs> it sounds fantastic. Yeah. Well, there, I, like... think, yeah. I think there's some. Uh, I think there are some good recommendations. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like we could keep talking, but some other time. I was thinking. I was. I would love. I mean, for Manuth, if I could just like keep inviting Ian and you back to talk. <laughs> just me, every week, it's me and Ian. <laughs> yeah, we could just have a guy's podcast, you and me, Nicole. <laughs> do you find any podcasts funny? Uh, yes, I do very much. Uh, but I, I have a major issue with podcasts, mm. which is that I feel like all the talent of our generation is being squandered on these this nonsense. On yeah, yeah, I really think like they're the ones I like, and I'm not going to say their names actually. <laughs> like you think Faulty Towers is bad, <laughs> um, but <laughs> I really think with the more talented they are, the more I'm like, if this was any other generation, you would have yeah. been forced to sculpt a great hour or yeah. a great series, and it's just or just even be like a stand-up comic. Do you know yeah. they probably would have had to just do that. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. But this is for um, me like this is fun, right? I mean, talking to you is fun, mm. but like I spend years on a few pages. You know what I mean? And I think that's I where for me this is how I need to live my life. But it's also mm. the so therefore I respect it in others. And I just mm -hmm. find the podcasts they're simply too long. You know what I mean? They're too. <laughs> there's long. many and many of them as well. Like there's so many of them. The river of shit, Nicole. It's just it just keeps going and going and going and going. And this is the comedy now. It's like even the funny ones. The reason I'm finding them funny is because they're making the jokes you're making. Is like I don't know what's going on. You know yeah. something like this. Did you but, see the news? Yeah. <laughs> what's up with those guys? Yeah, 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 yeah. Jeez, that USA is crazy. Um, I, I'm I'm okay. loving this too much, but I'm gonna read through the comments and we're get, if there's any questions. Um, I think we've been so into ourselves uh, <laughs> but i think it's good okay so uh welcome to in jokes smiley face no these are direct sorry neve to everyone r.i.p mark fisher r.i.p sophie clark says i can uh, <laughs> uh neve says internet is professionalized used to further writers careers not a space for this type of discourse Ooh. Mm. I think that's true, Neve. For me, I like using the internet to further my career. <laughs> <laughs> Be, Do you think it furthers your career? No, it's, it's no, it's career. it's it's hampered me. Um, but I I don't know, Neve. Maybe I'll talk about this with you sometime later. But I don't know if I really even believe in discourse anymore. I don't know if it mm. exists. Like mm -hmm. in the same way, people don't believe in Santa or God. I just <laughs> yeah. I don't know if discourse exists. Whoa, you don't believe in Santa? I thought we established. Wait, which one's the good one? <laughs> <laughs> um, has the internet helped your career, Neve? Uh, it's, it's not Neve, Nicole. I'm Nicole. 
<laughs> Nicole, uh, yeah, Nini Bass. Has the internet helped my career? Or I has it ushered so. discourse for you? No, I don't think it's actually helped my career in any way. And I left Twitter and things for a long time. I think I left from like the end of the, the start of the second lockdown last year to like summer this year. And I think we were talking about it before because I just, it was just too loud. And like, that is my issue with it. Like I was like, I, particularly with everything that was happening, I was like, it's just it's too loud on there. And like, every time I went on, I'd be like, like my internal pro like thought process was like, shut up. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> like I, I'm not like, not in a nasty way. Like, obviously I was very aware of everyone's like suffering and like difficulties and things, but like I, it was just overwhelming for me. And like trying to create something in that was just, not useful so in many ways I don't think I ever got my you're similar to me like we both kind of were published had stories published I never got my start in writing through through the internet I know mm -hmm. many people have and it has been like wonderful for them but I, I did I didn't and I, I can't imagine what it'd be what it would be like if I did then again maybe it has I don't really know I don't know this is kind of another conversation but I feel mm -hmm. like you know I'm talking to younger people and they write in a different way mm -hmm. and some of them are like oh, I like publishing my stuff and then getting feedback from the mm. online space so I can change it. Yes, I and this to me is like, mm. this is the opposite of what being a writer is to me, but maybe I have like this old romantic idea. I don't know. And also I would say very, like you mentioned this with Hardy books and, and this country mm. when you were talking, boredom yeah. and is where creation yeah. happens from. Absolutely. Creation doesn't happen from yeah. being plugged in. No, you know? no, I think that like, that is something fo so fundamental we like we've kind of lost in some respects and I mean that myself too like I go on Twitter I use Instagram and stuff mm. and I just like me and my sister were talking about this recently enough like like we both we grew up in like a very small town where like the default state was boredom <laughs> like yeah. if you were not bored like you know like you had to find stuff to amuse you all the time and I think that that like you had to talk to people or, or like read books and things and yeah I don't know. I think that's where like lots of, or my impulse for for writing even even comes from. So I think yeah. this not being bored, is like isn't good at all. I think I think a healthy amount of boredom, yeah, is good for you. And and boredom that is not, not being plugged in. You know, like yeah. a, a, like I don't know. It's it's yeah. When I think of like there's now I went to Kilcock School, Skaldara, mm. very very ordinary school. Like you mm. know. A great school but like very normal like you know mm. uh 20 percent of people would you know do the lca 35 yeah. percent of people would go to college something like mm. this you know from that school three writers have come there there's been me mm. louise nealon and um a, a guy going to be published by new island next year declan yeah, that's so this, good. this is madness yeah. you know and i wonder you know this is like i don't know anyway we'll go on to the next question <laughs> Um, but you, I think so much of good comedy, like we were saying with Hardy Books and things, like I think, like I still remember watching the early YouTube Hardy Books clips, like <laughs> when like the inter like my friends on my J one when I was like nineteen, and we were all crowded around like the one computer someone had brought with them, and like someone some when we knew from home had sent them to us, and it was just, they were just so perfect. It was, was so like, exciting, yeah. and wasn't it? I remember there was this period around two thousand and ten when the price of cameras dropped. And yeah. my friend did a master's on, he said, now film comedy, it's going to explode because now yeah. everyone can afford to do it. Mm. <laughs> it was never, yeah. it was never that, you know, yeah, it was yeah. never the price that was stopping the comedy. It was, I think it was the time, you know, the, mm. the hanging around in poor, I mean, you know, they had to hang around in Mayo, poor lads. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it worked. Let's go on to the next question. Let's go on to the next question. Poor Tracy. Also, oh, yeah. sorry, go on. <laughs> I also was just thinking there because of Hardy Books, and I was thinking about it in relation to the talk I'm doing tomorrow evening as well, because Vivian Dick made a lot of films in the 80s and stuff. And we can't deny that, like, so much good comedy just comes from hanging around with your friends. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. the funniest, like, like, just doing nothing and, like, being with your friends that find you funny and you find them funny like yeah. i just feel like and that's probably where so much comedy has come from and like the fact that we're now living in circumstances that makes that less and less likely you know you have to have two jobs to pay rent you have to do like you're not yeah. seeing your friends because they all live down the middle of nowhere like you know like that is that is something that is stopping a lot of good comedy i, I think or a lot of good creative work generally yeah 
I mean, I, for, you know, like with me and you, I think like the thing of being a writer is you're so on your own, yeah. you know, which is a bit different from theater, but mm. this kind of, when you think of like, I've been watching the Beatles documentary and it is the oh, same yeah. thing. It's like the four yeah. lads, you know, yeah. and it's like this endlessness yeah. to like fiddling, you know, and mm. constantly trying to make each other laugh. Like yeah. those guys could have made the best sitcom. You know what I mean? Like they definitely had it. Yeah. You know? Um. Okay, new questions. I mean, <laughs> Boris and Trump says Sophie Clark use buffoonery as a magic cloak and a redirection tool that exempts them from responsibilities for their actions. Yeah, I just, sure. I think that's, I think that's just yeah. true. Yeah, we're in agreement, Nicole. <laughs> yes, agreement. Uh, Neve, I think she's joking. George W. Bush is bad commuter, but actually pretty erudite. You know what? Mm. I mean, he went to Harvard. He uh, mm. he managed to get off a cocaine rap. So I mean, he must be pretty smart. <laughs> Uh, Maria O'Brien yes it's the same mentally as it's only banter but with a more sophisticated application I assume this was the the guy in the pub yeah yeah yeah, yeah. oh here we got one. Oh, Colin Walsh says Phoebe Waller-Bridge has said comedy is a great way to catch people off guard with darker story material get people's defenses down with a laugh then stick the knife in while they're laughing yeah, I would agree. On the flip side, Tom Morris. Is this our Tom Morris? Is there any other Tom Morris? I don't know. I don't know. Tom. Yeah. Tom Morris has right talked back. about needing to restrain himself from inserting jokes and one-liners in his stories. For him, comedy can be a defense mechanism that the writer uses. <laughs> this is definitely our Tom Morris. <laughs> yeah, this is. Yeah, yeah. Make the joke, Tom. Uh, <laughs> Get online, Tom. <laughs> to you, avoid their material. Okay. All right. I think we, I think you and I definitely agree with the, oh. okay, so my question, sorry it's so long, haha, would Nicole and Oshin would be, to what extent do you agree with those statements and when working on your own material, how do you negotiate a path between these principles? Okay, Ooh. I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer this one because I think Nicole says the laughter is disarming. So for me, the laughter has to be a gift that comes like it's like it comes like it has to be unexpected but it also mm. comes from the story now I don't write jokes to hide myself I write mm. jokes to expose myself in mm. a way that's palatable or mm. a way that shows that I am not who I think I am maybe mm. you know I think something quite profound is going on with a joke but this kind of nervous laughter and one-liner thing mm. where like I I that's yeah. I don't I, I don't do it I don't have it in me Mm -hmm. I'm like I'm happy to be a joke mm -hmm. a ridiculous mm -hmm. person and my for my stories to be like that so comedy is a defense mechanism I have nothing to defend anymore you know so I don't I really don't do that I think know? that's much more kind of like in your personal life you know mm -hmm. like I don't think I use it in my stories because I think there's all it through the redrafting I hope like a certain mm -hmm. like vulnerability will arise but like I think in real life I certainly didn't like want it in real life. <laughs> if I didn't want to talk about something, I would be like, <laughs> I'd tell the most horrific story and then be like, ah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, you know, leave. So like, I think that like, that is something that like, yeah, I think a lot of Irish people definitely like a lot of my family, I think we all do that. Um, yeah. But I would hope that in my, in, in my writing and, I think in all good writing that I admire, if you can see that the writer is, is doing that, it, they're doing it intentionally, that the character yeah. is doing it, you know, and, and you can spot it. Um, so, yeah. I think this is, you have to have this awareness. So when I was saying I, in that previous question, I was talking about my work because, you know, I'm yeah. just in a, you know, but I think it's just bad writing to mm. not, yeah. it's not bad writing. Let me rephrase it. Mm. You, you, Nicole, work with your stories for a long time. Like mm. there's so much in each paragraph. You just, yeah. they're, you're rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. Mm. So by the time it's happening, you might still be a bit shocked by what you're doing, mm. but you know when someone is lying. You know mm. what I mean? That when the joke yeah. is a defense mechanism. Yeah. So in that case, it's more a choice. Yeah. So I suppose this question, I feel with Tom Morris, what he says there is Tom Morris edits a lot of people's work. Yeah. And I think he's talking about people who are in a drafting stage. 
Mm, I think mm -hmm. it's like to get to the truth, you have to remove the kind mm -hmm. of like glib joke, you know, yeah. which I agree yeah. with as well. I think I, I do agree with them both. But I think what Phoebe Waller Bridge said is for me, I, I fully feel to deal with very fundamental mm. issues such as birth, yeah. death, sex, I do mm. think comedy is the correct. <laughs> yeah. Not all yeah. the time, but I think it is an avenue. Like, I can't imagine dealing with, like, grief without comedy in some respects. Like, I feel like any funeral or any grief I've suffered in my life has always been countered by this extremely funny moment. <laughs> or, like, someone trying to, like, you know, trying to make you laugh because I feel like that's the... Uh, the it would help, you know, it's such a such a help at those kind of times i think yeah i think this i think there is something so fundamentally absurd about yeah. existing in a finite body yeah. that if you were to like i don't like it <laughs> but it's both figure isn't it? to upload our consciousness soon. Yeah. well it's like i like it and i don't like it it's sad <laughs> and it's funny you know <laughs> can i ask you a last question um yes um, for uh, me um, we got so many questions people like us so much <laughs> What's the next question? What's the okay, question? Sophie Clark says, thank you so much for the lively and enjoyable conversation. I love the energy and the fluidity you, of talk and information. Quick question, when did you know you were ready for publication? Hmm. You take that one, Nicole. Oh, yeah, I think that that's a, that's a good question. I don't think you ever really know. Um, but I feel like, I don't know. I think you can kind of take things to like a natural conclusion or when the voice is like clearest to me, I think that I'm, I'm, it doesn't mean it's ready for publication, but it means I could be ready to, to show it to someone and then they will tell me whether mm -hmm. or not it's ready. Most often it's no, <laughs> but I think like, oh, it's not ready. <laughs> yeah, but that is still a higher stage of readiness than yeah. the previous yeah, one, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. I think that like, yeah, I think st it's staying too long with it without letting someone else see it can also, can also be a bad thing, you know? Um, mm. But yeah, that, that would be my, my answer there. That's good, that's good. Neve mm -hmm. says, uh, I relate to Nicole's clueless female clown. <laughs> People may be afraid to make their female characters stupid or useless. Not Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> the more stupid and useless, the better. Um, Rosie says, no questions, just thanks for such a gas and thoughtful hour. Cried laughing at your descriptions. Haircut looks great. This is directed at me. <laughs> it does look good. It does look good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dara says, Oshin, what do you find so funny about Charles Dickens? Um, I, think he, I think he's, for me, he is when the English character happens. So, like, mm. what I know to be Englishness, you know, beyond all the horror, you know, <laughs> Yeah, but when I, for England, which is, you know, obviously it's very dear to me, it's literature is very dear to me, it appears with him. So like when he has like a working class chimney sweep, mm. he understands how hilariously particular one individual can be in a society. And he does it again and again and again and again and again. He always has, and it's like, his stories are often so boring. And then he just knows to give you this one ludicrous person who's very recognizable. And I just, for me, it's, the, it's that thing. It's where this person, I kind of like what, what Nicole was saying of, it's kind of the same, you know, the character stays the same. I mean, I will remember forever, there's a character in one of his worst novels, um, Martin Chuzzlewitz, where her name is Mrs. Gamp. And all she does is talk about her husband's fake leg. And like, you know, just she constantly talks about it. And then at the end, it gets stolen. And it's just like, I don't know how mm. you had to be there during the thousand page <laughs> novel. But anyway, that's that's my answer to the question. Nicole, you had a question for me. Then I'll ask you a question and then we'll finish up. My question to you was, what is your favorite comedy in film? So what is the film that always makes you laugh? Because I just actually want to know. I just want to watch something later. So. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I don't know, my favorite one. Okay, I'm, this is just because my dad showed them to me when I was a child. This isn't like me being posh, mm. but like Duck Soup by the Marx Brothers oh, to me nice. is like, 
I don't know, maybe because I grew up with it, it was just yeah. the thing. Aeroplane, I keep coming back to all the time. What I, I really think you should watch uh, To Be or Not To Be. Oh, okay. Have you seen it? It's 1941. Um, yeah, it's by is Ernest a, is, Lubitsch. No, who's in that? Uh, it's kind of, I don't know. I don't know. Greta Garbo was in his previous one called The Notchka, but it's Ernst Lubitsch. It's 1941. And it's about these guys and they have to pretend to be Nazis in a play to like win the war or something like this. But it's just, mm. it's unbelievably funny. It's so I good. actually, I actually find a lot of the like 1940s kind of like romantic comedies um, really funny, like bringing up baby and things like that. Like they're yeah. really slapsticky. Mine is uh, Spinal Tap. Oh, <laughs> I want to change my answer. <laughs> Mine is <something. laughs> This is the one th like a film that you know you put on and you'll always just be like, <laughs> like yeah. you all it'll all, some gag will always make you laugh, you know. I think that's and it's because your favorite comedy is this country, yeah, is it, at the moment. So yeah. you love the docudrama, you love that yeah, way of yeah. getting at characters, yeah. And they're like, they're that's like two examples of comedies for just like things don't improve, like they don't really. I love that bit in Spinal Tap, and I always think about it, like, whenever you've got a bad review, you know, when they're reading out the, the reviews, and they're just like, you can't say that. <laughs> what is it, shit sandwich instead of shark sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that. So good. Spinal Tap. Qu last question for me. Um, I, yes. So, your first book was very... Let's, I'm not going to say personal because that actually does you a disservice, mm. but it's very, you chose the content insofar yeah. as we choose. I don't think writers yeah. choose, but it's you. This next one you're doing is uh, real people, real historical people. Um, Nicole is writing about uh, Edgy Cedric. Ed, Edgie Cedric. Edgie Cedric. Edgie Cedric. Edgie Cedric. The, she's in a brief. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. It's set in the factory. But is it funny? Can you make it funny? You know what I mean? Like, so where's the funniness? It's a harder thing, isn't it? Or I don't know. I'm asking you, is the voice, is the funniness still there for you? It is a harder thing, isn't it? Like, I've, as I was, I do think that's a genuinely harder thing to do. And I think also because there is so many serious parts in the factory that, you know, like... <laughs> Like things went wrong, <laughs> like you know. Well, definitely. that's where you're getting the humor, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> no, like more, th not as funny as like I would want them to be, but I think that like, yeah. So I think I, I've, I've had to kind of find it in different places. And I, I think there's parts of it that are funny and certainly amusing. Like you might yeah. be like, ah, <laughs> the way you laugh when you read a book. But I, one th a film I was thinking about a lot in kind of relation to this is. Uh, the Paul Thomas Anderson film Boogie Nights, which I find parts of that movie, yeah, just like so funny. But then the overall, it's just so sad overall. And you're kind of like, how did he, how did he do that? So, mm. yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been coming back to that quite a bit, you know. Well, he's the master. He's the, yeah. in in my time more so than any writer, I think yeah. he's the one that I think. And I rewatched There Will Be Blood after. You watched it for the first time recently, mm -hmm. and I always saw it as the saddest thing yeah. in my life. And now I yeah. watched it again. Comedy front to back. Yeah. Like, he's completely the most ludicrous yeah, yeah. person. Like, he's so mm. grotesque. Mm. And then there's still that sadness there. So, mm. I think, I think you've yeah. answered my question there, Nicole. I think I'm, I'm looking forward to this uh, Nowhere special. When's it out? No, nothing special. Nothing special. When's it out? Um, it's not nothing special, is it? I think your biography on one of the things says nowhere special. Well, now they'll just have to change it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually quite like nowhere special too. Um, but uh, yeah, so hopefully maybe ne end of next year, early the following year, hopefully. Yeah, fingers crossed. So it's another year. Yeah. Fuck. That's so slow, isn't it, our lives? Jesus, like, you wouldn't believe it, you know, like... Anyway, that's probably my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's another thing. But nothing special. Get it next Christmas. Get it soon-ish, we hope. <laughs> yeah, get it next Christmas. Yeah. Um, thank yeah. you so much, Nicole, for doing oh, this thank with you, me. I had a lot of fun. I had loads of fun. Yeah, I hope it translated. 
Uh, <laughs> everyone at home is like having no fun at all. They're yeah. like, oh. Us just laughing at each other. <laughs> <laughs> in jokes. That's why it's called in jokes, people. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Ashin. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, thank you again to the English Department and Kildare Library thank Service for everything. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, it really appreciate it. And thanks for, for uh, sticking with us. Okay. Thank you, Tracy. And I think we're good to go. All right.